So here's an image that I've actually uh, came across again uh, sometime recently. Um, I never sat out to have an art appreciation uh, YouTube channel, uh, no by a long shot, but um, this is the second uh, the second uh, video I've made that actually has an appreciation from for some of the art from the past. But um, this particular image, um, it's called The Distinguished Men of Science of Great Britain, and it's from uh, 1807, 1808. It's all the living uh, legends, essentially, uh, from the scientific community from uh, that time, uh, that time frame in Great Britain. Uh, so if you go looking for the likes of Isaac Newton or Robert Hooke, Robert Boyle, none of those fellows are going to be in it because uh, they're, of course, pushing up the daisies by the time this image is actually done. And uh, obviously the guys after, many, many greats after, that you can think of, uh, they'll be absent as well. Um, so I don't pretend to know. There's 51 fellas actually in this, and they are all men. Um, there's 51 fellas in this, in this image, and uh, I don't pretend to know all of them. Not, not by a long shot, but I recognize some of them right off the hop. Uh, I don't know all of them. This image, by the way, you can find it if you go uh, go looking on uh, on the internet, you'll find it. And there's also a key that you'll find that is actually numbered, and there's a legend that correlates with the numbers, of course. So you can see that's the original image, and uh, that image that's the uh, key that actually explains everybody and who they are. So you can cheat. <laughs> you don't need to do it the hard way. You can do it that way. Um, but I thought, well, how many of these guys do I actually recognize before I actually use the legend? And there's a couple I do recognize actually right off the hop. And uh, so I thought, there's 51 fellas in this in this uh, in this frame. Um, let's talk about maybe five or six of them. Uh, and and I intend to know everybody actually in this picture by the time uh, by the time I'm done. How long will that take? I don't know to study up on all these fellas. I don't I don't need to know all of their intimate details about their their biographies, but. I would like to recognize them, um, know who they are. If they're in this image, they're probably worth knowing, knowing who they are, the, the way I see it. So I don't want to ramble on and, and make this too, too long. Uh, so I'll try and keep it as brief as possible and I, I won't get into too much of the detail. Um, understand that I will just touch on the on the slimmest of details of their lives and probably what they're maybe best known for, at least what they're best known for in, in, my, in uh, my mindscape anyway. So we'll start off with um, this fella. Here comes the orange hand. Somewhere, Donald Trump's. Uh, anyway, there's uh, this fella sitting right here, seated. That's actually Edward Jenner. I uh, recognize him. Edward Jenner is a famous uh, English uh, physician, um, epidemiologist, I guess we call him in modern terms, uh, studies communicable disease, infectious disease. I uh, hope I got that term right. Um, and he's actually famous um, for his, he was, he's famous for vaccination development, essentially. He's really the father of vaccination, as far as I can tell. Um, perhaps there's some individuals before him. I'm sure, like all these fellas, there's usually guys who've done some work before them and certainly lots of people who've done work after them. But these guys are pioneers in their field. Edward Jenner is actually the fella who actually, he's responsible for the outrageous act, by today's standards, an outrageous act of actually infecting an eight-year-old boy with smallpox. Now, the backstory of that is he actually, um, he put two and two together and actually came to the realization that milkmaids, because of their close proximity with, with cattle all the time, of course, they seem to have developed an immunity or at least a partial resistance to cowpox as opposed to the, the general population. And he actually, he put two and two together, theorized that, well, if you have a, a resistance to cowpox, I wonder how that would actually um, affect your resistance to actual smallpox, full-blown smallpox. So what he did is he actually took some infectious material from the finger, uh, apparently a boil on the finger of a, a milkmaid from what I've read, and, uh, and actually intentionally injected it in an eight-year-old boy. Outrageous act that would never be tolerated for two seconds by the uh, by the ethics of today's standards, and nor should they be, of course, right? But keep in mind, we're talking about fellows who lived uh, the better part of uh, 300 years ago, you know? So don't impose today's ethical standards on people who lived that many years ago. It's not fair, the way I see it anyway. Um, so anyway, luckily for him, his theory turned out to be correct. Um, the boy, uh, he infected the boy intentionally, as I said, with, with smallpox. And because of the previous uh, infection, his system had actually developed some uh, immunity to it. And uh, the, boy, the boy managed to survive, proving the point of Jenner. And he went on to develop that theory in a, in a full-blown vaccination uh, uh, approach for the general public. So lucky for the general public. Um, who's to say how many people would have been missing uh, after, uh, after him had, uh, had he not actually developed that theory. So uh, yeah, that's Edward Jenner right there. Phil well deserves to be in this picture. Phil well deserves to be in this picture the way I see it. Um, another fella I recognize, this fella right here. You might recognize the uh, the, the profile uh, portrait of him. I've seen it a number of times before. I think this particular image is actually just 
an amalgamation of all the famous portraits of all these guys uh, kind of uh, come together in a culmination of this, the distinguished uh, man of science of Great Britain, as I said. Uh, so that this fella right here, Henry Cavendish. <laughs> Sorry, but that, his name escaped me there for a second. Uh, Henry Cavendish is, I don't know a great deal about Henry Cavendish and his, uh, and his work. Uh, a big part of that um, is intentional on his part, I think. Uh, he'd done a lot of work. He, his main interests, I think, were um, in mechanics, in, uh, in physics. Um, he seemed to have an obsession with the uh, Earth itself, the weight of the planet itself, and the density of the planet. Um, how that comes into physics, I, I don't really know, to be honest, but I'm sure uh, um, weights and measures of all kinds are always an issue in, uh, in science, of course, so that was his thing. And uh, apparently he actually managed to come up with the weight and the density of the Earth to quite, a, quite an accurate degree, even some 300 years ago, better part of 300 years ago. So that was uh, that's Henry Cavendish. That's the fellow seated right there. That was his thing. He's also well known for um, I don't know if he actually don't know if he actually discovered hydrogen or whether he was responsible for the isolation of it. But he done a lot of work with uh, with hydrogen as well. So uh, yeah, that was uh, his contribution. And that's Henry Cavendish. I think he done a lot of other work as I said, but he didn't publish. He didn't, he didn't publish all of his work. Um, so I think a lot of people went on uh, to actually uh, to further some of his studies at least within the circles that were aware of the work that he actually done. A lot of his work actually went unpublished. Another fellow that I recognize seated right there. That's John Dalton. John Dalton uh, actually is most famously known for his atomic theory. Uh, John Dalton is the one who actually pushed the, uh, the notion that um, uh, everything on the face of the planet could be broke down, compounds could be broke down into elements and uh, in their general makeup. Now, he never took it so far as, you know, much later in the... Uh, in the early 20th century, Niels Bohr came up with a model and stuff of what we know, you know, with the uh, <clears throat> electrons, neutrons, and protons, the, the standard atomic makeup. He never took it that far, but um, he certainly got things uh, rolling in the right direction. Again, that is John Dalton right there, best known for his atomic theory. Although I think a good part of his life was actually spent uh, studying meteor meteorology and, uh, and atmospherics. The, uh, another fella I recognize, I have a passing interest in machine tools, that fella right there, Henry Maudsley. Henry Maudsley is the fellow who came up with, uh, he developed machine tools to, uh, to such a high accuracy that he actually managed to standardize um, a simple thing, which seems simple today, but if you think about it, in the grand scheme of things actually made a huge contribution to the further, to further the cause uh, of the Industrial Revolution was the standardization of a simple thing like thread pitches. His machines were so accurate and so well built, he could, he could replicate um, cutting threads to an extremely high degree where he could actually start to make parts interchangeable and uh, the interchangeability of, of things obviously moves things forward with respect to mass production to, to, uh, to a great degree. So that's Henry Maudsley. Um, Hen Henry Maudsley had a couple of famous students, a uh, couple of famous uh, apprentices that actually worked with him. Um, just trying to think of their names. Do, uh, Whitworth? With Whitworth was a guy who actually, uh, you might recognize that name from, again, he's a, uh, Whitworth developed his own style, uh, standard of screws, um, nuts and bolts and stuff like that. Whitworth, um, um, hardware, still out there today, still in use. Uh, not, not too, too, uh, well known, I think, by the general public, but, uh, it is out there. And, uh, the other fella, um, just trying to think of his name, uh, synonymous, synonymous with the uh, steam hammer, um, Naismith, James Naismith. James Naismith was another fellow who actually worked under uh, Maudsley. Uh, he went on uh, to develop uh, the steam hammer. Of course, he's, he's famous for his gigantic steam hammer that he developed uh, for forging uh, um, steel, of course, right? Um, who else? Let's move on. I'll try and make this, again, try to move on reasonably quickly. Um, so who's that we've covered so far? So we've seen uh, Jenner. We've seen uh, John Cavendish. Um, Seated is actually, uh, sorry, Henry Cavendish. John Dalton is uh, seated there. Also seated at the table here, uh, we've seen Maudsley, Henry Maudsley. Also seated here, uh, front and center, as he well should be. Of course, I think most people would recognize James Watt when they actually see him. James Watt, <clears throat> and uh, let me zoom in a wee bit here. So there's, there's James Watt, and seated not directly next to him, but close to him, is his partner in business right there, Matthew Bolton. Um, of course, Watt, world famous. I think almost everybody knows who James Watt is. If there's anybody in these in this picture, uh, in this image that they would recognize, I would say it's probably him, right? So James Watt, most famous for his uh, invention of the steam engine. Well, anybody who knows anything about steam knows that that's that's just not true. James Watt did not develop this the steam uh, develop the steam engine. Yes, he certainly did invent the steam engine. No, he certainly did not. Uh, there was plenty of big names in science and engineering that actually came before 
um, watt with respect to uh, steam, steam power, uh, namely uh, Newcomen and uh, Savory. Um, Savory for his steam pump, uh, dual chamber uh, vacuum pump, uh, vacuum chambers uh, that operated on steam, and uh, and Newcomen uh, wee bit later uh, for his famous uh, atmospheric engine. Um, both of them grossly inefficient. James Watt actually rose to prominence in the uh, scientific community because uh, he came up with a brilliant idea of actually having a separate condensing uh, chamber for uh, Newcomen, uh, Newcomen's uh, engine. Uh, the gross inefficiency of Newcomen's engine actually stemmed from the fact that the cylinder was being constantly heated and then cooled, heated and cooled. Well, uh, I don't think you have to be a genius to figure out the fact that uh, as grossly inefficient to operate something like that. However, you do need to be a genius to figure out how you actually remedy that. And this fella right here came up with that brilliant idea of a separate uh, condenser uh, for Newcomen's engine. It improved the efficiency many, many, many fold. So the uh, the coal mines that were actually using the Newcomen engine weren't going broke, actually trying to feed the boiler in order to keep the Newcomen engine pumping the water out of the mines. Um, so Matthew Bolton, sitting close to, uh, close to, uh, James Watt there. Matthew Bolton's the fellow who actually financed um, all of the uh, the industrial endeavors of uh, James Watt. And uh, you can, I think you could strongly argue the point that if it wasn't for Matthew Bolton, uh, Matthew Bolton uh, came from a wealthy family. Apparently his family made their money on uh, toys and buckles <laughs> from what, uh, what I had read. Um, and uh, yeah, he was in a position to actually afford uh, James Watt. So the Bolton and Watt engine, well, they'll be forever synonymously, inextricably linked with each other for the rest of their lives. So th anyway, I better wrap it up before I hit the 15 minute mark here. So, uh, yeah, look these fellas up. All good stuff. Um, the distinguished gentlemen of uh, science of Great Britain. That's it. Cheers.